I originally started out my deployment in Alpha Company. Unfortunately, when Scott Bronkhorst was killed, I was reassigned to Bravo Company 3rd Platoon, 1st Squad. I had heard a lot of rumors about Bravo Company's AO. Uh, not sure what was true, what wasn't. All I knew is that in Alpha Company we could hear the detonations on a daily basis. We were going to recover uh, our new platoon leader, Captain Chow, and on the way back in, uh, our front vehicle in the convoy hit a pressure plate IED and flipped it about 25 feet in the air. Uh, I was vehicle two, and after the dust settled, uh, I ran to the vehicle that had been flipped on its side and expected the worst. And luckily, everyone inside uh, was still alive with minimal injuries until I realized that I was looking inside of where the turret used to be. And Michael, the, the gunner at the time, uh, was nowhere to be found. It dawned on me that the vehicle part that I saw flipping about 45 feet in the air was actually Mike still attached to the turret. I quickly located the turret. Uh, with a couple of the guys from the platoon and all I saw was feet sticking out the top and I knew that I knew it wasn't good. I, I, all I could think was I just killed a member of my squad uh, the first day I was here. We looked inside the turret and Mike was not only lying but he was very frustrated that he was being choked out by his Bose headset. Uh, so we, we pulled him out of there and called up a, a nine-line medevac for him and Sergeant Knorren's child, who unfortunately sustained a leg injury and couldn't come back with us. like any other day in the valley. We had just gotten him back from uh, when he hit his first IED in, in the MATV about two weeks prior. And we came back to the squad, we were going out on a regular patrol, clear some orchards. You know, the, you know, the subtext for everybody is, hey, go out and try to not die. I was still worried about putting him back out on patrol, but he was eager. He wouldn't stop begging me. Um, so I talked to First Sergeant McAllister and he said, yes, get him back out on patrol. That day was relatively quiet, but it was, there was a lot of disturbed earth on our way back in. And looking back on it, we were being pushed from one side of the orchard to the other. We were climbing over a wall that we had just kind of knocked down. You know, we cleared it as best we could. They made it over, myself and Doc made it over, as, long, as well as uh, Sergeant Hooksma, the Bravo team leader. I was, uh, was about two people in front of Mike, and you know, we thought, hey, he was the you know, second last person in line, we made it out. And then, just like that, it felt like uh, the air had been pulled out of my lungs. second to last person in line, we made it out, we're home free for the day, that's it, breathe easy. And then uh, I just remember just a, a big shockwave hitting my back, just like a deafening sound, and just being thrown forward and the wind knocked out of my old body, and just not knowing what in the world that was. And then we turn around and you know, we see part of the wall that was there is now just gone, just a big hole. 
Gerardo was hit, and I ran back with Doc to assess the situation. We see Mike laying in a, an old irrigation canal full of water. He was missing his leg, and it looked like his arm had been ripped open by a shark. His arm was barely attached. Um, his leg was, was mostly gone below the knee. You know, our first thought is treat immediate injuries and you know, we put a tourniquet on his leg and we've got people holding his head out of the water and we just we need to get to a safe spot and drag him out and bring him to a field and I, I remember I remember having you know a scalpel in my hand ready to, to make an airway in his in his neck because I was worried he wasn't gonna be able to maintain his own airway anymore because he was so deeply injured. He was unconscious the whole time. You, know, you just remember thinking, like, hey, these little gasping breaths that he's taking are him clinging to life. And we, we still kind of cling to the idea that he was going to make it through because we all knew him to be a fighter. I mean, who comes back two weeks after hitting their first IED and they just volunteer to go on the next patrol? You know, he's, he's ready to get back at it. He's a true paratrooper by definition. I moved back on the other side of the wall um, where I called up a nine line. We handed him off to the air crew. Once the helicopter landed, I knew that was the last time I was ever going to see Mike. I, I did not think that somebody could survive something like that. Um, so he, he leaves, and we have to make the short walk back to the cop, and, and we all just, we just lost it. He just looked at me and said, why? Why this guy? Why Mike? You know, why, are we, why are we here doing this? You, know, we, you, you take every step, and Every step you take, you you think it's going to be your last, and we were we were all mostly over this wall, and you know, he, he had to be the one that stepped on it. I was uh, I was about two people in front of Mike, and you know you just kind of feel guilty. I always say that the first time that I was going to see him post-injury, he really wanted to make sure I understood the extent of his injuries. Michael has always been determined and probably a little stubborn with what he wants to do. I think he knew before I did how long this road was going to be. I didn't realize it. It was not a life he wanted for me, but I would do it again, over and over and over again.